a bit of warning that we're being recorded. So just to bear that in mind, if you are going to speak, etc. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much uh, for everybody who um, has joined uh, or who is in the process um, of joining. And this gives you an idea of our agenda for today. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I uh, wear a few hats um, at, at, at the university. Um, I'm an associate professor in the School of Food Science and Nutrition, so it won't surprise you that my some of my day research uh, relates to nutrition and lifestyle interventions uh, to help us uh, age uh, in a more healthful uh, manner. Um, uh, I'm also head of the uh, graduate school for the Faculty of Environment and a little bit later you'll you'll see how how this is quite useful uh, for the work that I'm doing uh, here today and it is my great pleasure to um, be here in in one of my hats um, as the chair of uh, this open uh, research group. Uh, so today while yes I'm going to introduce um, our new uh, open research statement really what I'm going to do is try to contextualize this statement uh, as part of a continuum um, and so speak to uh, uh, the open research activities uh, that the university has done and, and where we see things uh, maybe moving um, in, in terms of the future. Um, so a, a key question on, on any sort of vision and strategy uh, journey is why, and, and many uh, people believe that whenever you set about doing any sort of task, you should start um, with the why. Um, and we actually found this um, quite easy to write, uh, and the why is, is the last sentence uh, in our statement. So fundamentally, we believe that an open research culture will increase research quality increase research reach and reproducibility. We believe open research and an open research culture will facilitate interdisciplinary and international collaboration. And ultimately, we hope advance knowledge um, and, and transform uh, lives. So another question could be, why now? Um, and in some ways, you know, uh, our guest speaker is, is from the University of Reading, who was one of the first uh, universities to put up a research culture and uh, open research statement on their university. And if you're kind of impatient, you think, oh, well, what have we been doing? Why are we only now putting on this uh, uh, statement? Um, and actually, Again, whenever we move in certain strategic directions, it's really useful to look back. And I think Winston Churchill said, the further back you look, the further forward you can look. Uh, and Professor Selena Stead introduced me to this uh, pestle analysis, which is a very useful analytical tool to sort of see where we've been and 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 where we're going and and this can be applied in all manners of uh forums and selena does so in her own research um but i thought it would be interesting to kind of put together a, a timeline uh for open research and what were the key external factors uh that have influenced the direction of travel for open research not just here at the university of leeds but 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 everywhere um and i think it's really interesting and and you know what's the first point on a timeline is arbitrary um, but a lot of people will argue that Project Gutenberg, which had as its mission to digitize books, and, 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 and this is really the roots of, of what was first called the open access movement, uh, and now we use the much more inclusive uh, term open research. So it was this idea that knowledge should be preserved, and of course uh, librarians have always been the curators of, of our knowledge. Um, and so the open access movement from the very beginning has been this, this marriage between uh, digital technology and the curation and the preservation of, of scholarship early knowledge. And over time, it, there have been um, external regulations that have mandated, and, and it makes sense, right? So if the taxpayer is paying for research, that research should be open uh, to, to everybody. 
Now, open access spoke to what outputs should be. Open research goes much further, and we'll talk about that in terms of being open uh, throughout the entire uh, uh, research process. And we can look at this from uh, a University of Leeds-centric uh, way. So uh, high-performance uh, research computing facilities, these are essential to lots of the amazing research that, that we do here at the University of Leeds, and that was founded very, very early on. Our White Rose uh, Repository, uh, an incredible resource for those of us in, in Leeds, Sheffield and York, uh, came online in 2004. In 2014, we had our first open access policy and actually the formation of the scholarly uh, communication steering group and some of the work that that steering group over over uh, saw for many years has now been subsumed um, into our open uh, research group. Um, in 2015, we started our, our research data, uh, uh, our research leads data repository, um, and with Nick Shepard and Graham coming on board, uh, we really focused on open access and open uh, research uh, training. Uh, some of you may know we have an amazing uh, grassroots community, um, and this uh, picked up pace over COVID as we embrace new ways of working, um, and these open lunches are a regular occurrence, as are is our uh, reproducibility T uh, uh, group. So when we get to 2022, although it has been busy, uh, we have formed this new group, um, we've had hit some amazing milestones, it's important to recognize that this is just one step um, in what has been um, a longer uh, journey. And the, the other part of the why now is related to a larger piece of work um, that is ongoing, which is to articulate our uh, research culture uh, strategy and vision. And what you see is that enabling open research practices is one of four pillars along with uh, embedding EDI, recognizing diverse forms of research activity and supporting teams that we see as being essential uh, to achieving um, our, our research culture vision, which is that more of our colleagues um, will produce uh, leading research and do so collaboratively, um, inclusively, openly, and sustainably. So we don't want people to do open research and have the platforms disappear and it not exist in, in another 10 years. Uh, so here's the group and I'm just honored and privileged um, uh, to work uh, with these individuals. Um, we have representation from across uh, the professional services, uh, key decision makers uh, from the library and IT and uh, professional uh, development, as long as, along with uh, representatives uh, from each of our faculties. Um, so one of our challenges in terms of open research and in terms of deciding what's important is making sure that we speak uh, to the breadth of uh, research and different types of research activities uh, that occurs across uh, the university. And we also have representation uh, from some, some really fabulous uh, early career researchers. In terms of governance, um, so we sit al alongside the metrics group and early career group and, and the EDI group um, under the research culture steering group, which is chaired uh, by Kat uh, Davies. And there's lots of interaction between these, these groups because our portfolios cut it across um, each other. Um, and here's where I've highlighted it becomes quite useful um, that I also uh, chair the uh, PGR development steering group for the university. And for instance, one of the ways that that's had an effect is we've been able to put um, an open research question into the press. So we'll be able to uh, look at uh, our trajectory uh, for providing open research uh, training um, over time. So it, it was a busy year last year. Uh, we met for the first time in February. Um, we did both internal and external stock takes and envisioned success and um, challenges. Uh, March was a busy month trying to figure out how we would spend some very welcome Research England funding. Uh, and that funding has been used um, in a variety of different ways. Again, trying uh, to make sure we don't leave anybody else out. Uh, we, we funded some case studies. We did some scoping exercises of citizen science platforms um, and uh, platforms called referatories, uh, and we were also able to, to support some ongoing projects that we had uh, related uh, to, to um, uh, Wikimedia um, and, and Carpentries. 
And through the summer, we also uh, got our drafted uh, open research statement um, through the, the appropriate uh, university governance uh, strategy. So our statement went live. So this launch event is a bit delayed. The statement has been live for a few months, um, but we were particularly keen uh, to invite Robert uh, uh, here. Um, we became institutional UKRN members. Uh, this is thanks to a long-term strategic vision of Daryl O'Connor and Ica uh, Rink, and that had been a, a, a long piece of, of work, but it, it's coincided uh, very nicely. Um, and uh, our hub went live. And towards the end of last year, uh, what we focused on uh, was our um, prioritizing our strategic objectives and uh, action plan. And I suppose strategic object objectives are the how. So, you know, the how of what you're going to do. Um, and these were reduced from a pool of about 13 um, through an iterative uh, process involving the, the whole group. And, and we settled on uh, the priorities of raising awareness, um, refining our training. So we have some training, but um, it's time for a refresh, uh, fairly attributing uh, research contributions and um, improving uh, external access to the University of Leeds um, research. So we met December 8th and, and we've adopted um, this objectives key results uh, approach, which is we're mapping key results for each strategic objective and, and, and narrowing these down to short, medium and long term actions. And, and this is just because we don't have enough money and enough time to do uh, everything. Um, as you can see, raising awareness and training are key um, and, and we're really pleased that our open research information, which has previously been on the library hub, but it's really important to recognize that open research cuts across um, all portfolios and is um, a critical part of a researcher's development. So we're moving um, those web pages and, and, and revamping um, everything. And uh, we hope by the end of summer um, to have an, an initial uh, training uh, module ready to go, in part because we need this to uh, train our champion of, of, of networks. So now I'm finally at the what. What is this open research statement? And I think it's two things. Uh, the first thing it is, is a commitment. Uh, it is a commitment from uh, the university to to a set of actions to embed open research practices. Some of these we've been doing anyway, uh, but we are formalizing that this is, is, is key to, to, to business um, uh, going forward. Uh, we want to improve, improve our discoverability and external engagement, uh, training and development across all disciplines. This is a very interdisciplinary space, and depending on what discipline you're in, uh, your open research journey um, may be uh, quite different. And promoting open research uh, externally as, as well as internally. The second thing the statement is, is an ask. Um, and what we're asking is all our researchers, and that's everybody from undergrads up, um, where possible, and we, we use that term where possible because we know um, that there are people who are working like myself um, with organizations um, that have uh, intellectual property uh, issues or there might be patents on the line. So this is where possible. Where possible, we want people to prospectively register and share protocols and methodologies. And we want people to do this because we know it improves research quality. Uh, we want people to share software code and, and data sets because we believe in open knowledge and we know that when these things are shared, uh, the research goes uh, further. Uh, we want our researchers to use persistent identifiers and the appropriate licenses, licenses and to ensure that all our research outputs are open access. And last but absolutely not least, we want people to adopt the practice of engaged research. So this is engaging the public in research from the very beginning, if not quite co-producing research uh, questions. So not just getting a focus group right at the end uh, because it's uh, uh, convenient. Um, the future is bright. I think our biggest challenge as a group is assessing all of the different technologies that are out there and are coming. And, and we have to do some um, fortune gazing to 
to, to see what tools are most needed um, and for which faculties. So uh, the needs of our social scientists um, and uh, the people in arts and humanity are likely to be different uh, from the, the, the needs of, of those of us who, who are in STEM. And before I introduce Robert, I just want to say some thank yous. Uh, Firstly, to our open research uh, group members, and, and this is uh, past, present, and those ad hoc members who've joined us um, when we've had, um, just towards the end of last year, we managed to meet in person and we've had our uh, strategic meeting where some of our colleagues uh, from Open Education uh, joined us and, and their voices are, are very valued. Um, huge thank you to Daryl and Ika um, for the work that they did uh, to bring uh, our membership of uh, the UKRN. So this is the UK Reproducibility Network for anybody who doesn't know. Uh, we've now become institutional members, and this means that we're sharing best practices and there will be some of those training facilities, modules that have been worked up by other universities um, that we'll be able to avail of. Um, and I'd also like to thank our grassroots community. Um, those of you who, who come to our open lunches, um, Kelly and Ika again um, for, for managing the reproducibility uh, T uh, networks, um, all of the efforts that, that you've been doing for some years now are, are paving the way for uh, the work uh, that we're, 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 that is ongoing. And if I could just make a plug, um, Nick Shepard, who many of you will know as, as the face of some of our open research training uh, here at the university, um, is going to put into the chat the links to these case studies and the poems. So the case studies is a very long stream, so you kind of have to do a lot of scrolling, but we're going to sort that in terms of organization. But if you haven't heard these Wikimedia poems, um, there's an article about this project. Um, it's just a beautiful marriage of open uh, knowledge and open research um, because they, it was led by two PGRs uh, and the goal was to create awareness of some of these open tools um, and the poems are just um, they're just a delight uh, so I, I hope um, that we can uh, get those uh, better disseminated but with that from me and we will have time for questions later um, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, our, our guest speaker Robert Darby so as I've said um, the University of Reading was uh, I believe the first university in the UK to have an outwardly facing uh, open research statement and at our last count and this might not be completely precise we were um, I think 22 or 23 when we got our research uh, statement out. So Robert is a uh, research development manager there at the University of Reading and he's led a lot of their activities in the open research space uh, for the last um, uh, several years and um, he is going to hopefully make our journey a little easier by giving us a uh, warts and all uh, perspective. Uh, so Robert you're very welcome and I'll, I'll stop sharing um, my mic now uh, if you can share your presentation. Okay uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me see. Um... There you go. Great. Thanks very much. Right. Can you can you see that all right? Yes, we can. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you. Uh, right. Oh, hold on. Now we can see you. <laughs> we lost that again. Uh, sorry. Did you press the wrong button or? We can always do a, a Chris Whitty next slide, please, if you're struggling with it. Hold on a second. Um, the green bot, the green arrow at the bottom. Yeah, I'm just just trying to. Uh, okay. Oh. Right. Is that okay? Yeah, that's back. All right. Sorry about that. So, um, 
So yes, thank you very much, um, uh, Bernadette, for that um, for that introduction, and, and to Nick for the for the invitation to to come and speak to you today. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to, to to come and celebrate the launch of your open research statement with you. Um, I, I'd like to say a little bit about our efforts to to try to develop open research culture at the University of Reading. Um, I hope I can draw out some of the lessons that we've learnt on the way. Um, and I'm going to. Uh, oh, can I advance my screen? I'm not quite sure how I can do this. Um, if you've got an arrow key on your keyboard, it should work. Uh, you've got the you, you just the PowerPoint, is it not the PDF? Uh, yes, it's just the PowerPoint. So you should just be able to do it actually in um, PowerPoint as you would normally. So you uh, so disregard the to zoom interface and just use um because we'll still see you because we're sharing you sharing your screen so you can sort of minimize zoom and you should be able to advance through your slides in powerpoint i think um i mean if you're struggling with it if you, I, I could share and as i say do okay chris um yeah i think that might be easier i'm, I'm i don't I know what it's like when you've got so many different things to think about <laughs> you can't, you can't. <laughs> Let, let's try that and see um I can find it myself now. Should I stop sharing this? Well, that should. So now I'm screen sharing. Um... Right. Said that now, and I'm doing the same. I've got that many damn. So can you see this slide now, um, but in edit mode or not? Oh, I'm struggling as well. Hang on. The thing that bugs me as well is the bar, the zoom bar gets in my way. So. Okay, that's that seems to be all right. That's. So that's the first slide. Yeah, but I'm um, I'm also struggling to advance slides as well. Hmm. Done this before with no problem. Right. I did. Uh, I did in the setup slideshow. I did go to the kiosk mode. I don't know if that's. I might be confounding it. So, hang on. Tell you what. Let's try. I'll try with the. Because um, you sent me the. It doesn't seem to be advancing for me either. I'll try it with the PDF because. One way or another, we'll be able to manage. All right, let's let's do it like that. That's is that working? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's okay. So sorry about that, everybody. I'm not sure what was going on. It's always the way, but. Uh... So hopefully you can see slide right. two. Okay, yes, so, so we're on slide two. So, so um, uh, I'm gonna start back in, back in 2016 or 17. So that's, that's really when we began our open research journey. And I think our initial premise was, was just, as a university, we, we're not open enough. Um, and beyond open access compliance, I think we saw very little evidence of open behavior um, 
among our researchers, I'd been in post as the research data manager for a few years at this point. Um, I guess was experiencing some frustration at um, a lack of awareness of research data expectations and low rates of effective data sharing. We had pretty poor attendance at open access and data management training. And generally, I think we we're struggling to, to, to achieve traction with, with our researchers, we felt. Uh, I think it's also fair to say that going back a few years, open research didn't really occupy much space on the agenda for uh, the university's research leadership. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so our open research initiative was, was a response to, to those conditions, but um, not necessarily a very strategic one, I think, uh, when we started. It was something that evolved as we engaged our stakeholders and, and developed more of a sense of purpose. Um, I think there are two broad phases, really, of, of the initiative. So in 2017 to 20, we were finding our way, we were engaging our research community at large and key stakeholders, uh, senior management, research managers, professional services. And our focus was really on communicating an understanding of open research, why we felt it was important, what it means in practice, and what people can or need to do about it. And we did also want to understand the perspectives uh, and the needs of researchers as well. How could we best support and enable them? I think from around 2020 or so, uh, I'd say we entered a phase of, of a bit more coordinated strategic activity towards creating uh, an open research culture. And this included putting into effect our, uh, our open research action plan. And that was a program of capacity building that, that was funded for the years 2021 to 23. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I don't know if you can see this very well. This slide um, highlights some of the milestones in the last few years. And I'll just mention a, a, few, a few things here. So in 2017, we organized uh, an open research themed conference for our university community. We called it Open in Practice. So that was the first attempt to, to start the conversation about open research within our research community. Uh, this led to a phase of consultation uh, with our stakeholders from which our open research statements uh, emerged in early 2019. And off the back of that, we developed various communications activities. We had a second conference. Uh, we ran an open research award competition, uh, which we also ran again in 2021. Um, also in 2019, a committee for open research and research integrity was formed under our new PVC for research and a commitment to uh, build a culture of open research was included as one of the objectives in the new uh, the university's new research and innovation strategy. Um, we joined the, the UK Reproducibility Network in 2020, which I think was, was, was another significant event for us. Um, and later that year, funding um, was approved for our, for our open research action plan, which we launched in 2021. And that included an open research champions program, which I'll say a bit more about later. Um, at the end of that year, Research England uh, awarded four and a half million pounds to UKRN and 18 universities, uh, including Reading, for what's called the Open Research Programme. And that's a five year project uh, to accelerate the uptake of open research practices across the sector. Um, and then this year, our university formed a working group to implement responsible researcher assessment, uh, including open research criteria in our recruitment and promotion frameworks. And this also led us to become involved in establishing a working group that's part of the UKRN's open research program, which is aiming to develop a toolkit to help institutions implement uh, responsible research assessment practices that, that include recognition of open research. Um, that working group is called, this is a bit of a mouthful, the Open and Responsible Researcher Reward and Recognition Working Group. And uh, I'm sure you can understand we call it OR4 for short. Um, so I think that gives us um, a bit of a sense of how things have evolved over time, how our coalition has grown, both within the university and also um, as part of wider sector networks. So I want to go on to talk about some of our experiences now. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so I mentioned our open research statement that was published at the start of 2019. 
Um, the idea was to broadcast a commitment to the principles and aims of open research, to tie together existing policies on open access and research data, and to encourage researchers to, to adopt open practices in their work. We provided um, supporting information to help researchers understand what we meant by open research, how it's relevant to them, what they can do. Um, so we developed an open research handbook, a sort of detailed practical primer. Uh, we published a series of open research case studies uh, very much uh, along the lines of, of what Leeds uh, have been doing. So examples of staff and students who've used open practices in their work. Um, I'm sure you're aware uh, a number of universities have released statements along similar lines in the last few years, um, and, and it's great to see Leeds join this club. Um, there's a snippet on this slide from uh, a very handy blog post by, by Nick Shepherd, which collates the statements on open research put out by UK universities. Um, and that gives a sense of, you know, how, how many have, have um, followed this path. And I think these statements, they are a very useful way of signaling institutional commitments. They provide a point of reference that can be signposted to researchers. And the process of developing uh, a statement and communicating and embedded it, um, embedding it, I think it's also a means of engaging stakeholders in developing buy-in. I'm sure you found that's, that's been the case at Leeds. It still, it still is only a step. And I think the challenge of actually changing research culture is a very complex one. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? So I just want to mention here this 2018 paper by the League of European Research Universities. We found it very useful at Reading. Uh, I think it helped us understand the need for a comprehensive programme of cultural change. So it's about developing your institutional leadership, infrastructure services, it's about training students and, uh, and academics, it's about em embedding norms in processes and changing expectations uh, and incentive systems, and also engaging with progressive elements in the broader sector, like, like the, uh, uh, the UK Reproducibility Network. Um, so next slide, please. So that's some of the thinking that informed our open research action plan. Um, so it's a program of activities that, that aims to develop the culture of open research at our university. It's being put into action by an implementation group that's led by one of our research deans. Um, I'd highlight three um, key themes in that plan. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? Um, so I'd say first we're, we're looking to increase um, our research support teams and their capacity to provide support and training. Um, and the, the UKRN's Open Research Programme is also very much uh, aligned with that objective and I hope will further enhance our capacity to, to deliver open research training. Um, second, we're, we're looking to embed open research norms in systems and processes. So I've mentioned work uh, getting underway to incorporate open research criteria in recruitment and promotion frameworks. We'll also be integrating open research objectives into research planning processes. Uh, and third, cu cultivating grassroots activity, which brings me to our open research champions program. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we launched that program in uh, 2021. The aim is to recruit staff and student volunteers who can act as uh, local advocates for good practice in open research. So we give them some support and training. We provide a small amount of funding so that they can run activities, things like workshops or, or training events. Uh, we give them a profile uh, on, a, on a dedicated website. And we also appoint a champion uh, to sit on the Committee on Open Research and Research Integrity. So um, we felt it was important to, to give them a stake in the university governance uh, of open research. Staff at any level can become uh, champions as well as research students. And we do have more senior staff, uh, including professors among our champions, but we have tried to make that role attractive as a professional development opportunity for more junior researchers as well. And we're now in the second year of that program. We have 25 champions across 13 of our schools, which is all but one of our research active schools. Um, next slide, please. So it is a voluntary role. So we let our champions find a level of activity that works for them. But as, as a minimum, we ask them to model good open research practice in their own work and to use their interactions with peers and colleagues to promote good practice and signpost support. And some champions they've really embraced 
uh, the role and the opportunity to, to develop it in different ways. Um, so just to give a few examples, uh, several of the champions worked together to carry out a, a survey across the university mapping the landscape of open research practices and needs uh, and, th and that's sort of informing some of our thinking and activities. Um, we had a lecturer in English literature who was championing open access uh, monographs. Um, we had an associate professor in pharmacy who has been developing an open hardware community. Um, and I think the good thing about the programme is that these are people, they're not senior management, they're not professional services telling researchers what to do, so, so they're researchers engaging their peers and colleagues, so they can make open research part of the conversation in those networks, um, and they can transmit the knowledge and, 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 the, and the motivation um, in ways that management and professional services perhaps can't. Um, there are challenges, though. Um, as, as our program is, is set up, the role is voluntary, so putting in the effort um, can slide down the list of priorities, and I think those at the more junior end of the scale may also sometimes lack the standing in their schools uh, to, to act effectively. Um, and I wouldn't underestimate either the amount of effort that's involved in running the program. The champions, they do need to be trained, they need to they need to be given ongoing support. Um, I've been running the program over the last two years and I'd say it's taken more uh, for me really than I have capacity for and even so I feel that the program needs more support than I can give. Um, and leading the program it isn't really core to my job description as a research data manager um, so I'm going to be stepping down from leading um, that program this year and we're now looking at how we can uh, sustain uh, some kind of effective advocacy um, uh, um, function within the university. So one option that we're looking at is maybe replacing a voluntary role with a partial FTE secondment, uh, perhaps as a school open research lead with some formal responsibilities uh, and accountability. But of course that's going to require funding. Um, so um, I think uh, nothing's decided as yet uh, as to what sort of shape that that, that kind of advocacy function might have in the future. Um, so can we go to the next slide? Uh, that's all I'm going to say on, on that subject. Um, I will just mention, we, we used our experience um, at Reading to produce a checklist for an open research action plan, which is um, available from the UKRN website um, in its UKRN primers uh, section. Um, we hope that might be something that would be of use to other universities. Um, so um, uh, if you are, are interested, then um, have a look at that. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? Um, so I just wanted to sum up now where I think we've got to and what we've learned that might be of interest to you. Um, next slide, please. So I think our engagement activities, they have created productive dialogue with, with parts of our research community and stimulated some action to promote cultural change. And we found, you know, developing consulting on an open research statement that did enable us to engage senior management and the research community. And I think it's led to a more strategic program of activities in, in our open research action plan. I think our senior management, they understand open research. It's about the quality of the research we produce as well as its accessibility, its potential for impact, um, and, the, and that there is a need for institutional change. And I think professional services are also collaborating perhaps more effectively together through this initiative. And that enables us ultimately to, to support researchers better. Uh, next slide, please. There has also been evolution uh, in the sector in recent years uh, towards greater focus on these issues of uh, research openness and reproducibility. So the UK UKRN um, emergence, I think, is, is significant of that. The recent grant um, from Research England for the Open Research Programme, I think it shows funders are, are taking the issue of open research very seriously. It shows that what we're doing as, as institutions is, is both reflecting and contributing to change that's happening across the sector. Um, next slide, please. I think we are at the beginning of a long road. There's been no widespread transformation of research culture in our university. I would say 
uh, for example, there's not necessarily been more than a, a very gradual increase in data sharing over the last five years or so. And the, there are other factors at play here as well, things like the adoption of data sharing policies by publishers. Um, so how much is down to what we've done as an institution is very difficult to say. Um, and I think by and large researchers won't change their behavior simply because using open, open practices is, is the good thing to do. Uh, being open is often hard work for little apparent or, or immediate reward. And I think in the absence of strong incentives and accountability and sufficient levels of training and support, many, many researchers won't change their practices. These are systemic problems and they do need systemic solutions. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think this blog post um, puts it very well. It's from Lizzie Gadd, who's a research policy manager at Loughborough. I'm sure many of you will, will know her uh, and know of her. I think her argument here is, is basically if we want to see significant change in uh, practice, we need to operationalize open research expectations in the systems and processes by which research is institutionally produced and managed, and we need to develop uh, the incentives. Um, I'm, could we have the next slide, please? Uh, I will share the um, slides afterwards. Yes, Nick, Nick does have them, so, um, so we can share the slides and some of the links as well. Um, so um, I mentioned earlier um, our working group to implement um, open research criteria in recruitment and promotion frameworks and the UKRN's um, uh, project to develop a toolkit for institutions planning to reform their assessment policies and procedures. And I do think that's absolutely necessary work that all institutions will need to undertake in the forthcoming years. I think the publication last year of the agreement on reforming research assessment is a really significant milestone here. Universities are being asked to sign up to the agreement and, and to join the coalition for advancing research assessment. And this involves committing to a reform of their research assessment systems and processes. And openness is recognized in the agreement as being integral to the practices um, by which research is conducted and communicated and validated. Um, and it's identified as a, as a key dimension of research assessment. Uh, and next slide, please. So I'm just gonna sum up very quickly what I think we've learned at Reading. Um, first of all, what is at issue here is cultural change. So this is a massive effort which has to take place on multiple fronts with the collaboration of multiple stakeholders. Uh, and it's gonna take time. It, it, it requires leadership, strategic vision, investment and long-term commitment. Uh, second, I think it takes time to develop that shared institutional understanding and to build the coalition of stakeholders um, who will drive change. Uh, and that coalition needs to involve senior management, relevant professional services, and of course, members of the research community. Um, third, we need to embed open research norms and expectations in the processes by which research is undertaken uh, and by which it's managed and evaluated. And in particular, research assessment frameworks need to develop to include open research criteria. Um, fourth, you have to be a supportive partner to the research community. You have to enable researchers to take ownership of the problems and the solutions to the problems. Uh, and we hope, for example, uh, this is where our Open Research Champions program can make some kind of contribution. Um, fifth, universities need to invest in support and training. I think it's always really hard to make the case in universities for expanding professional services, but I believe we do have to make that case. If we want researchers to have the knowledge and skills to use open practices, then we have to invest in the services and provide the training and support. And we have to integrate open research training at all levels. So undergraduates, they should be learning about the basic concepts and practices. Postgraduate students, early career researchers, they should be developing and applying practical understanding. And we need to reach the more senior academics and research leaders as well, because they're often the ones who set the example to the students and to junior colleagues. And finally, um, I would say there is a supportive, there's a growing community of researchers and professionals working together towards uh, a vision of open research uh, and making it a reality. Uh, and I think it's in our interest to engage with this community. Uh, I think that the ethos of collaboration that UKRN exemplifies does have the potential to, to transform research culture. And I think we can all benefit um, by participating in that. Uh, and next slide, please. On that positive note, I will conclude my talk. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. 
Thanks very much, Robert. Um, that was really uh, interesting. We 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 have been speaking to um, a variety of different universities on open research champions. So that in particular um, is an interesting one in terms of funding or not. Um, can I invite questions um, from the audience, please? Nick, do you want to chair this? I don't want to take away your thunder here. Oh, you can't drop me in like that. <laughs> I've only just got over the slides thing. Sorry about the slides. I'm not sure what was going on there. I, did, I was just pressing the button harder and harder to try and make it advance, but it didn't seem to work. So. I, it's, um, I, I actually brought my mouse. I have a new fancy mouse thing that I don't know how to use yet here, and I brought my one from home so I wouldn't mess up. So I felt very sorry for you there, Robert. Um, I'll I, I'll I take care. I, did, I didn't. I, I, I mean, I, I, we can do it together. Um, <laughs> but I guess I, I didn't know. I'd noticed a few. I don't know if any questions have happened yet. Have they? Or has anybody got any question? Um, I think there have been. I think there have been lots of of thanks for you <laughs> sharing uh, the knowledge and really useful um, uh, references to. Um, external information, Robert. Um, I think it's quite interesting. So we, I, I think, um, our, our um, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation, I think, is, is, is very supportive. So I think we've had the grassroots things happening, and now we have um, top-level commitment. Uh, where did you find the most resistance, Robert? I, I mean, we we hear different things from different faculties. I think there's a discipline specific uh, phenomenon to what makes people nervous or enthusiastic about um, open research. I think it depends on 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 what their field is. Um, I don't know. I, I, uh, I think I I wouldn't. It'd be hard to single out sort of um, specific areas of resistance. I think there, there's, you know, uh, a lot of the feedback that we get is, well, you know, it all sounds very good, but we don't have the time for this. Uh, and, you know, one of the arguments is, well, well, if you think it's important, then you make the time. But, but I think, you know, a, a lot of researchers are just sort of being very rational about managing all of the all of the demands that are coming yeah. coming at them from from all over the place. And I think, you know, be, because if you don't if you don't adopt the open research practices, you don't necessarily suffer um, uh, any any particular adverse consequences, um, and because the incentives are not necessarily always that that strong, it's 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 um, uh, other things will take priority very quickly, uh, and you know it's it's hard for researchers to 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 put in the sustained effort I think that it takes to, to actually change practices. And there's um, so many different platforms, you know, knowing where to get started. I think you raised an interesting point on the role of um, journals and funders in, in all of this, uh, perhaps because I am in biomedicine. Um, you know, I the, the FDA declaring that clinical trials had to be pre-registered was, was a land shift for us. So the incentive in my own field in terms of large scale data sets is that the journals require it, right? So, so um, open access and open data has been part of the genomics community for going, going back some years, but it is 100% an incentive because you look at what the best journals require to publish and it is a lot of these practices, um, but that's not true in, in all fields. And um, we've been looking at um, author taxonomies, and I was surprised that they weren't required by every journal because most of the ones that I publish in, this is part of the process, um, but that isn't, isn't true uh, everywhere. So I, I think journals have a lot of power. And interestingly, when I talk to colleagues my age and older, some of the resistance I hear to open publishing are from people who are editors of journals and who, who feel very strongly about the utility of, of, of peer review and are very nervous about preprint servers and uh, very nervous about predatory journals. So I think, I think the education piece of, of explaining how broad open research is, um, uh, is important that it's it's more than open access, isn't it? Just spotted a 
Bernadette, a couple of questions have dropped Great. in. But there's, a, there's an interesting one there, I think, that, sorry not to come to the ones that dropped in first, but from Hardy Schwam, um, who I know is uh, based in Ireland, formerly at Lancaster. Hi, Hardy, well, thanks for coming. But I think that's an interesting question, especially in the Leeds context. So he's asking, how useful is it to link open research with the even bigger concept of research culture, which also includes diversity and equality, or are we losing focus through such additional concepts? So, I mean, just to preface that with, I mean, certainly Leeds very explicitly um, includes open research in research culture. I'm not sure if they, if you do quite, quite so explicitly at Reading, Robert, or not, and if you've any thoughts on that question from Hardy. Um, I, th I think we we haven't yet. Um, we, we've probably, um, we've probably been a bit slow sort of developing our um, communications relating to to research culture there's been quite a lot of work on um, developing our support for um, good research practice uh, and um, research integrity within reading which um, has not been so explicitly tied to to open research I, th I think it is it is a very um, research culture is a very broad broad church and I, I can see um, you know, concerns about the risk of specific messages becoming uh, lost or diluted. Um, um, I, I think, you know, I, I think open research, um, it, it, you know, being transparent with um, your research processes and your research communications is is tied to research integrity. And I, th and I think it makes sense to make those those connections at the level of you know broad principles but but the you know the the support and the communications also have to be focused on specific practices and practical actions as well um i don't know if that's really answering the question yeah no i mean it i just it struck me as an interesting question because i do think it's useful as well i mean i'm just posting uh, that's a previous talk that we had. No, I've posted the wrong link. Hang on, sorry. Um, one more question from from Daryl, and I'm keen to hear your answer to this, uh, Robert. Is what steps has uh, Reading taken to monitor changes? And and I suppose to me, one of the things that has been useful in the dialogue across our different working groups. So each priority within research culture has its own um, working group, and I think that's one way we keep the narratives um, logical, but also work we're communicating um, with each other because there's this piece about responsible metrics. So assessing research through assessing the utility of, of the use of open, open research um, is necessary. So you, you need that cultural uh, change as well. So how are you monitoring? How are you assessing your open research practices, Robert? Well, I, I think, uh... I think to a large extent we're not really doing it. Um, I think it's uh, it, it's actually quite a it's quite a difficult thing to do to to actually monitor you know uh, comprehensively across an institution you know uh, shifts in aggregate practices. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we're interested in um, the the UKRN the Open Research Program um, project developing is um, it does have part of its work is about developing um, open research metrics and um, uh, the, uh, institutional reporting uh, sort of functionality. Uh, and so we'd be interested to see how that develops. I'm not quite sure how it is going to develop, but uh, uh, you know, I think that is a really big challenge, actually monitoring, monitoring practices uh, and being able to, you know, to objectively evaluate um, change um in, in you know in the in the aggregate profile of practices it's not easy um i'm mindful of the time where we went a few minutes um uh over and i i think uh it is time to close, although we um, could certainly speak for longer, and I trust that we'll be speaking um, again. Robert, thank you very much uh, for coming and being flexible when we had to rearrange from um, December. We really appreciate it, and uh, we look forward to working with you and colleagues across the UKRN uh, much more uh, going forward. So thank you again. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Robert. I've just spotted uh, another couple of questions there as well. So apologies if we haven't got to your question. Um, 
but we'll perhaps pick them up um, by email. I mean, the interesting question from you, Nicola. I hope so. Nicola Simmonson around institutional rights retention, and we'll, we've got another event coming up around that soon as well. But yeah, just to echo thanks to Robert. I'll stick around for a little while. I always think it's quite impersonal. You know, if you're in a room, we all just cut off. <laughs> well, yeah, if, you, if you're in a room with people, you say bye and you might have a chat on the way out or whatever. So I try to do the same with these as well. So no pressure, Robert. If you need to shoot up, that's fine. But uh, I'll stick around for a little while, but I'll stop recording now. Okay. That's okay. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. It was a pleasure to join you today. No, yeah. And Thanks, sorry, Robert. Thank you. sorry for the uh, confusion over.